Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. By now, you've probably heard me talk about my new book, Love Every Day. It will be out in the world in October, but you can pre-order it any time before then. And let me tell you a little something. Pre-ordering is one of the best ways you can support authors and their new books. Why? More pre-orders equals more buzz about the book, and more buzz means reaching even more readers. Because of this, I really want to thank anyone who has already pre-ordered or who will pre-order Love Every Day by offering them two free gifts. You can sign up to receive these goodies by heading to the link in the show notes of this episode or by visiting loveeverydaybook.com. You're going to fill out a quick little form with your proof of a pre-order purchase, like a screenshot of your e-receipt, plus your mailing address and your email. And then you will receive a complimentary Love Everyday journal in the mail. It's so beautiful. And a digital reader's guide in your email inbox. Both of these will arrive in mid-October, right when you're receiving your Love Every Day book. The journal is going to be the perfect place for you to jot down your thoughts and reflections as you read, and the digital reader's guide is full of discussion questions that you can use to spark solo reflection or to spur conversation in a book club, for example. Plus, the reader's guide includes the Love Every Day playlist with some of my favorite songs that celebrate growth, healing, and connection. To learn more about this offering, click the link in the show notes or head to loveeverydaybook.com. If you have questions about the pre-order gifts, email info at dralexandrasolomon.com for support from our team. Thank you so much. Hi there. And welcome back to Reimagining Love. It is just you and me today. And we're going to do a deep dive on a really fascinating and rather juicy relationship topic. So if you're a regular listener to Reimagining Love, you know that in these solo episodes, my goal is to explore issues that seem to be of particular interest right now, whether that's within the clinician community or in my clinical work or with the folks who follow me online, as well as every green relationship challenges. And sometimes those topics are kind of broad and abstract, like we talk about jealousy or relationship stagnation or communication. Well, today we're talking about a more specific day-to-day or should I say night-to-night issue that turns out to have wide-reaching impacts on relationship quality and relationship satisfaction. Today, we're talking about sleep, more specifically about sleep divorces. A sleep divorce is a phrase in the popular vernacular that describes a situation when a couple chooses to gasp, sleep in separate beds or in separate bedrooms rather than a shared bed, and that's for any number of reasons. So I'm going to be exploring this phrase as well as sleeping arrangements in general for couples. And there's a companion worksheet. So if you're a regular weekly newsletter subscriber, you'll get it in your inbox. If you're not a subscriber, you can, and I would love for you to, head to dralexandrasolomon.com slash subscribe, join the weekly newsletter. The link is in the show notes, and then you will receive the companion worksheet next week. Okay. What I know from my experience as a therapist is that the topic of sleep, sleep arrangements, sleep preferences can be really freaking fraught 
for couples. We know that the habits that couples build and the conversations they have about sleep can have profound and actually proven ramifications for each individual's health and for the health of the relationship. And we know that because of research done by sleep scholars like Dr. Wendy Troxell, and you will hear more about her in a moment. And because we put so much emphasis and importance on the so-called marital bed and this idea that quote-unquote normal couples should be able to share a bed peacefully and joyfully every night, it can feel emotionally heavy and frankly a little bit shameful when that is not the reality for a couple. If you're in this spot, I can imagine a few different thoughts that might be going through your head right now. Maybe you know deep down that the most viable way forward for you and your partner is to stop sharing a bed, but you're afraid to bring up this possible solution due to the weight and the stigma that sleeping apart brings. Perhaps you don't feel the need to stop sharing a bed, but you need new tools for the nights when issues arise between the two of you. Or maybe all is well between you and your partner, but your sister or your friend has had a sleep divorce with their partner, and you want to bring some more compassion and understanding to their situation so that you can support them through this change, even when the world may not. Regardless, I am glad that you're here. So we might be talking more about couples' sleep arrangements as a culture in recent years for any number of reasons. I'm hypothesizing, actually, that couples' sleep routines may have been challenged or disrupted by the years-long pandemic, which we are still, frankly, feeling the impacts of. Maybe it's the case that increased screen time and a huge increase in working from home could have changed or affected how couples sleep. And I feel pretty sure that the immense number of external stressors that we're living with right now, like economic uncertainty for us here in the U.S., the crisis of gun violence and climate change for all of us, that those factors contribute to our day-to-day anxiety and therefore affecting our sleep quality. Regardless, this is always a worthwhile topic to explore as far as I'm concerned. So let's talk first of all about this term sleep divorce, which is, like I said before, when a married or long-term couple chooses to sleep separately due to some kind of incompatibility or problem. And sleep divorces are common. They're really common. The National Sleep Foundation found that a full 30% of married or partnered people sleep apart because of some kind of an incompatibility. 30%. And by the way, I am not a fan of calling it a sleep divorce. You notice right off the bat that this phrase has a negative connotation, that although it's referring to a choice that a couple who is still married or still together has made, by using the term divorce, there's an implication that something has been severed within the relationship, that departing the shared bed is a kind of breakup within the relationship or potentially even a step towards the demise of the relationship. And further, while calling it a sleep divorce is intentionally sort of cheeky and dramatic, those who've gone through an actual divorce are not needing or wanting any additional drama. Thank you very much. Um, In fact, a while back, I made a reel on Instagram and I proposed an alternative term. So rather than calling it a sleep divorce, I think we should call it an SSA, a strategic sleep arrangement. I cannot say to you that this term has taken off. It really has not taken off. I think it's really clever and I think it works well. I think it highlights that many couples who choose to sleep apart do so as a reflection, in fact, of the care and respect they feel for each other, not as a sign of something being broken or a rift or disengaged engagement or drifting apart. So right up top, I want to name a few things, and then I'm going to give you a roadmap for where we're going to go in this conversation. First, sleeping apart certainly may be a symptom of a larger relationship challenge, and it may certainly be a reflection of eroding relationship quality. 
It might be a step towards divorce or breakup. But what I'm doing here is challenging us to work with our assumptions. The assumption is that sleeping apart is dangerous. The assumption is that sleeping apart is a poor prognostic indicator. The assumption is that sleeping apart signifies the end of intimacy. And that's what we're going to challenge in this conversation. Next, this episode is not about convincing you to make any kind of changes in your sleep habits with your partner. As is the case with nearly all the topics I talk about here, there are not easy answers, there are no formulas, so that's why I just am here to advocate for communication guided by relational self-awareness. And if you are finding yourselves needing some more support or guidance, of course, bringing a couples therapist into the mix is never a bad idea. I'm going to offer some tips and frameworks later on in the episode. And I want to acknowledge that this topic touches on some really tender stuff, vulnerability and touch and our needs and health, et cetera, et cetera. There's no shame in seeking support and facilitation when it comes to topics that are as meaningful as that. And then finally, when we're talking about sleep divorce and having people sleeping in separate rooms, I want to acknowledge that there's a measure of privilege in this arrangement because it's predicated upon the idea that there are, in fact, alternative places for people to sleep. Sharing a bed and sharing a room might reflect necessity as much as it reflects preference. So, Let's talk about this very powerful idea of the marital bed. (laughs) The shared bed is ideally a place of safety and comfort and togetherness and restoration and pleasure. And for lots of couples, that's the case. Whether or not they've had to overcome differences or challenges around their individual sleeping habits, for lots of couples, they've been able to co create an environment where both people feel a nice mix of emotional and physical space and emotional and physical closeness. And that just right mix lets them be able to generally count on getting a good night's sleep. And for other couples, despite their best efforts, the bed has become a place of tension, compromise, discomfort, stress. And there's any number of scenarios that contribute to this tension. Snoring is a big one mental or physical health conditions that make sleep difficult or unpredictable, different preferences for temperature, for lighting, different preferences for bedtime and wake-up time. Those are just a few, and any of these can drive a wedge between partners. Couples are then at risk of taking the fact that they have a sleep incompatibility and making meaning out of that fact taking that fact to be a reflection on the state of their relationship or maybe even the viability of their relationship. I've worked with so many couples over the years who have faced sleep challenges, and I've seen them try in earnest to find solutions and compromises that please all parties, and I've seen how challenging that can be. On top of this, there's just a lot of pressure on couples to make bed sharing work. and some shame if they can't. This idea of the marital bed has changed throughout human history. It's something, in fact, that two authors, Brian Fagan and Nadia Durrani, explored for a book they wrote. That book is called What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History. (laughs) Durrani and Fagan say that beds and bedrooms have been regarded as private spaces during some points in human history and public spaces during other points in human history. And they note that even though the general construction of a bed has stayed relatively consistent for over 5,000 years, what has changed a great deal over the course of history is who occupies beds and what that means culturally and interpersonally. However, beds have always been a symbol of marriage over the centuries, even if the cultural boundaries and the rituals continue to change. And beds have also been symbols of sex for a very long time, as the bed is where most people, many people, some people (laughs) explore and express their sexuality. Think about common phrases that we use, like they're good in bed, or he's in someone else's bed. In these figurative phrases, the bed itself 
represents and encapsulates human sexuality. So in most of our minds, our beds and our sleeping habits say something profound about the quality of our relationship, about the quality of our sex life, and even about our morality and our adherence to cultural norms. So it's no wonder this whole topic can bring up so much stress and shame for couples. And we also know that the stakes are high when it comes to creating a sleeping arrangement that ensures good sleep for all. We spend about one third of our lives sleeping. And research tells us that sleep has an enormous impact on our physical health and on our mental health. In Susan Worley's 2018 research and literature review in a journal called Pharmacy and Therapeutics, she notes that sleep deprivation studies confirm that not getting enough sleep is tied to a ton of health issues, including hypertension, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, impaired immune functioning, et cetera, et cetera. And we all know that terrible feeling of getting up in the morning after a restless night of sleep. Our mood is tanked, our productivity is compromised, and it's so much harder to extend compassion and patience to other people. And by the way, just learned this in doing research for the episode, apparently this idea of catching up on lost sleep, yeah, that's apparently a myth. A 2019 research study from the University of Colorado found that sleeping in after a bunch of nights of not getting enough sleep does not reverse disruptions in metabolism that are induced by not getting enough sleep. So you can't like catch up at the end of the week if you've been kind of cutting corners all week long. You still are going to end up with metabolic impacts, even if you're trying to make it up. Darn it. <laughs> Okay, and then there is the deep and nuanced relationship between sleep and relationship quality. And this is where Dr. Wendy Troxell really comes in. So she and her colleagues suggest that one of the problems is that we have historically looked at sleep as an individual behavior. But we're getting that wrong because a full 70% of people who are in relationships do share a bed with their partner. And so because of that, we also need to think about sleep as a couple behavior. Fascinating, right? So here's what she found. Not getting enough sleep or not getting good quality sleep harms the relationship. For example, 25% of people surveyed said that their lack of sleep negatively influenced their intimate or sexual relationship. But sometimes not being able to get enough sleep or good sleep is precisely because of a partner. So a quarter to a third of married or cohabitating couples report that their intimate relationships are negatively affected by their own or their spouse's sleep problems. One quarter to one third of married or cohabitating couples report that their intimate relationships are negatively affected by their own or their partner's sleep problems. Sleep problems in one or both partners contribute to marital problems. Not sleeping well increases relationship distress. And the arrow goes the other way too. Research has also found that women who report being happily married are less likely to report sleep problems. And couples who have high levels of self-disclosure, couples who are able to open up about their feelings, have been found to sleep better than couples who have lower levels of self-disclosure. And this makes sense. In her 2017 review of all the literature on sleep and relationship quality, Dr. Trexel describes sleep as a fundamental attachment behavior. In order to fall asleep next to someone, you need to feel safe. You need to feel able to trust the person whose body is laying next to your body. When you're sleeping, your guard is down, like it's all the way down. You're not aware, you're not vigilant, and understandably, sleeping next to someone is a potent way to build and nurture feelings of safety, feelings of trust, feelings of closeness. Not the 
only way, that's not the only way to build trust in a relationship, but it definitely is one way. It takes trust to fall asleep next to somebody and falling asleep next to somebody builds trust. This really landed for me because when I'm working with couples who are in the wake of recovery from infidelity, for example, sleep is nearly always disrupted. And that's clearly in part because of the immense amounts of stress and upset that a couple experiences in the wake of this kind of relationship crisis. But it's also in part because of the breach of trust. It's just very hard to let down and fall asleep next to somebody who does not feel trustworthy to you. So I have found that sometimes couples need a chapter of sleeping apart as we work on reestablishing a sense of stability and safety. And then at some point, beginning to sleep together again can become one of many avenues that they can rely on and practice and use to do the long, hard work of rebuilding trust. So bottom line, the research confirms what we all know from our personal lived experiences. Sleep problems equal relationship problems. And that's why we need to be doing this episode. Okay, if any or all of what I'm saying so far is resonating for you, Just take a little pause, place your hand on your heart, do some deep breaths. This issue kicks up some emotions. So remember how common these struggles are. You are not alone. You are brave for seeking solutions, for thinking outside the box, certainly the box being what our culture has told us about how we should be sleeping if we're coupled. And I think the most helpful shift that you can make if you're facing sleep struggles is for you and your partner to reorient your relationship to the problem. What do I mean by that? Shift how you look at the problem. It's so easy to get lost in blame. You're too noisy when you come into the bedroom. Well, you're too sensitive. You want to keep the room too dark. Well, sleeping with you is like sleeping with princess and the pea. Your snoring is out of control. Well, you need to stop being so critical. You know that I can't help it, right? This like back and forth, finger pointy tug of war. So rather than continuing this either I'm wrong or you're wrong, try to imagine the two of you sitting shoulder to shoulder, facing this problem together as a team. What are we going to do about the sleep challenge that we're facing? Sleep challenges are hard because they're hard, not necessarily because partners are being too unreasonable or too disruptive or too needy. If you can start from a place of compassion for yourself and your partner, you can commit to facing the problem as a team. And that helps set you up for success and creativity and finding a path forward. Finding a path forward that minimizes tension and that maximizes sleep. Okay, so you know in these episodes that I love to look at the cultural kind of big picture. I look at the interpersonal dynamics and I like to look at what's happening inside of both people. So we've already done that kind of big picture foregrounding. We know that we carry beliefs about the idea that if we are right for each other, we should be able to sleep peacefully together. We have falsely equated the idea that sleep challenges equal doom and gloom for our relationship. And we need that. We need to keep that in mind because that helps us have faith in our ability to do things differently in the service of our relationship. So let's look a little bit at the interpersonal dynamics, what happens in the space between two people. We can't make a simple equation that sharing a bed builds intimacy and sleeping apart erodes intimacy. It's not that simple. I have known couples who sleep apart and who have actually really high levels of emotional and sexual intimacy. I have also known couples who sleep night after night in the very same bed, but have little to no emotional or sexual intimacy. And that's because cultivating intimacy between two people has far less to do with where you rest your weary head at the end of the day And it has far more to do with how you relate to each other during your waking hours. And I want to remind you that it's really freaking hard to feel patient with each other and to feel attracted to each other when you are exhausted and annoyed by chronic and unaddressed sleep incompatibilities. 
and the story that the two of you tell yourselves and tell each other about whatever sleep arrangement you come up with is far, far more important than the arrangement itself. The story you tell yourselves, we are doing this out of love. We sleep apart because we care so much about ourselves and each other, and we have other ways of cultivating intimacy. That's a story that buoys a couple versus a story that we have to sleep apart and we're really afraid of what's going to happen and it puts us at a disadvantage. That story has the power to take on a life of its own. So let's think about what happens inside of each partner when there's a sleep challenge. You know, we all come into a relationship with a particular sleep profile, you know, and I think we could probably line all of us up on a spectrum from a super easy sleeper, somebody who can fall asleep anywhere, anytime, any context to those of us who tend to be more sensitive sleepers who require some more attention to what's happening around us. Even if two people are relatively good sleepers, the chances are zero or very, very, very close to zero that two people are going to have the exact same set of needs, routines, and tendencies. In our marriage, (laughs) Todd has had to work to accept my deep love of a white noise machine in the background as we sleep, and also my deep love of my big ass body pillow. (laughs) And I've had to accept that in the summer, he prefers the room to be much warmer than I prefer it to be. So that's just one example. And the good news is we don't have to be the same to be close. Sameness is not a prerequisite for intimacy. But it's a reminder that between any two people, you put any two people in a bed together, they're going to have to have a conversation about what's happening inside of each person and how they're going to create conditions that maximize good rest for both of them. So when you have these conversations with your partner, keep in mind that just because you think that 68 degrees is objectively the perfect sleeping temperature or that pitch black in the room is the only way to go, that does not mean that you are right. Everyone's idea of a perfect sleeping arrangement is different. It's their own. It's idiosyncratic. And like all spaces created in a relationship, your bedroom setup is going to benefit from a spirit of co-creation rather than a one-up, one-down right, wrong mentality. And I want to just put one quick note in here about this idea of how dark or light a room is. For those who are survivors of trauma, a little bit of light in the room when falling asleep can ease the hypervigilance and fear that are so often experiences attached to trauma. And therefore, a partner who is able to accommodate their partner's need of having the room be a bit lighter than perhaps they prefer is being what I call an intimate ally, being a supporter and a helper on somebody's healing journey. And when that kind of accommodation is possible, it's so lovely. And if that accommodation would come at the expense of your own sleep, You may need to get creative and remind yourself that that's not the only way to be supportive on your partner's healing journey. So we looked at the cultural stuff, the interpersonal stuff, and the stuff that's happening inside of partners. So let's move on to some conversation starters that you and your partner can use if you're having some sleep challenges. And if you're interested in opening up a conversation with your partner about the possibility of sleeping apart, even just some of the time, I'm going to give you 12 relational self-awareness questions that are going to hopefully guide you toward a mutual understanding with your partner. And these questions can also be found in the companion worksheet for the episode. And again, if you're a newsletter subscriber, you'll just get them. They'll just appear in your inbox like magic. But if you are not a newsletter subscriber, now is a good time to become one. And you can sign up at dralexandrasolomon.com slash subscribe. And that link is in the show notes as well. And then you will receive the companion worksheet next week. So 
whether you are the so-called low-maintenance sleeper or the so-called high-maintenance sleeper in your relationship, I want to make sure that you both ask and that you both answer all 12 of these questions in your conversation. And that's because it's not a me problem or a you problem. It's an us problem. It's a sleep challenge. It's a sleep incompatibility. And you guys need to approach it as a team. So see if talking through these questions helps you shift your relationship to the problem and perhaps opens up some new possibilities for how you can work creatively and collaboratively to protect both your relationship and your sleep. Okay, question number one. When you were growing up, how did the big people in your home sleep? Question two. When you were growing up, how did the big people in your home talk about their sleeping arrangement? Question number three, what does a great night's sleep look like to you? Be specific. Describe the room. Describe what's happening before you fall asleep. Describe what's happening as you fall asleep. Describe what you are thinking and feeling inside of you as you get ready and fall asleep. Question four. What are your associations or musings or relationship to the concept of a sleep divorce? Question five, do you know any couples who sleep in separate beds or separate bedrooms? Question six, when it comes to our sleep challenge, what's something I do that helps you feel seen, heard, and understood? Why? Question number seven. When it comes to our sleep challenge, what's something you'd love more of? Question eight. When it comes to our sleep challenge, what's something you'd like less of? Question number nine. What worries you most about our sleep challenge? Why? What makes it hard for you to talk to me about your concerns? Question 10. How do you feel about having a conversation about making some changes to our bedtime routine. What might you worry about in that conversation and what might you feel hopeful about? Question 11. If we decided to sleep apart, even some of the time, how would we protect our intimacy and our closeness? Question number 12. If we decided to keep sharing a bed, how could we better protect our sleep? Okay, I hope that some or all of those questions can be fuel for a self-reflective and curious conversation between the two of you. I also recommend the two of you have this conversation outside of the bedroom, on a walk, in the car, or some other neutral space. This is a tip that therapists suggest for conversations about sex, but I think the same thing holds true here. Talk about sleep outside of the bedroom. And then bonus points. So in addition to not having the conversation in the bedroom, bonus points for having this conversation on a walk or on a hike while your bodies are in motion. I like the idea of hard conversations with bodies moving because that way you remind yourselves that you're not stuck. Your nervous systems can feel relaxed and safe. And the movement of walking parallels setting off together in a new direction. It parallels being proactive rather than stuck. And I think that experiencing a new perspective literally, right, because you're walking, so you're seeing some new things, parallels the idea of figuratively seeing things from a new perspective, seeing the challenge from a new perspective, especially if this is a problem you've been living with for a while. Okay, so last part here is if the two of you are seriously considering a strategic sleep arrangement, not a sleep divorce, but a strategic sleep arrangement, I'm going to give you eight suggestions as you venture into that new territory. Suggestion number one is to consider starting with a part-time plan. So rather than going from 100% of your nights together to 0% of your nights together, try a little schedule. Maybe you alternate days, one day together, one day apart. Or maybe you sleep apart on weeknights and together on weekends. And that might be especially helpful if you work all week. So on those work nights, sleeping separate and then coming together on the weekends. 
And even though we learned a little while ago that you can't make up for lost sleep, I suspect that alternating days or making a weekday weekend distinction might relieve some of the stress while helping you adjust to this new way of being. And it might also be the case that knowing that you have some nights apart helps you feel less bothered and more patient on the nights that you are together. Suggestion number two, practice positivity. If your story is we have to do this because we have a severe problem, the transition is going to feel heavy and risky and very, very consequential. If your story is that we get to do this because we both value sleep and we both take the quality of our relationship very seriously, then the transition is a reflection of the love you feel for each other and the commitment you have to the relationship. Number three, bring some play to the transition. Because you're sleeping apart, Perhaps you can build a little bit of anticipation for those times when you will reunite in bed together. I wonder if perhaps separating in this way could fuel a little bit of mystery, a little bit of sexiness between the two of you. It could be fun. You know, the measure of good sex is not whether or not sex happens spontaneously when two people lay down together. The measure of good sex is whatever two people make it to be. And by planning a naughty little rendezvous in one person's bedroom, that may be the marker of a really fun sexual experience that highlights to both of you that there's value in setting aside a time and a space for touch and pleasure. Suggestion number four is to create your spaces. If each of you will now have your own room, how might you make that space feel special? feel like it celebrates you and your uniqueness, and perhaps is a space that you're excited to show off and invite your partner into. Suggestion five is to be intentional about your pre-sleep rituals. I was reading an article getting ready for this episode about sleep divorce. It came out just last week in Forbes, and this article emphasized that if you're going to start sleeping apart, it's a very, very good idea to make sure that you carve out time for togetherness before you retire to bed. So make sure that you have, I mean, this is, you know, intentional time together is good for all couples, but especially important if you're going to separate for your bedtime routines. So before you do that, you know, take some time together to check in about your days, watch a show together, do an activity together, whatever that is. And then six is be intentional about post-sex rituals. I was reading a recent sex and psychology blog post by the very fantastic Dr. Justin Miller, And he was writing about some research in the Archive of Sexual Behavior that was published back in 2014. These researchers found that couples who report that they spoon or snuggle after sex, those couples score higher on relationship satisfaction. Now, it certainly could be the case that happier couples are more interested in spooning after sex, but it seems safe to say that the arrow goes in both directions, that spooning after sex also increases relationship satisfaction, right? You spoon because you're happy, but you're also happy because you spoon. And especially if you're going to start sleeping apart and therefore you don't get those benefits of sleep as an attachment behavior, as I was mentioning earlier, make sure that you spend some time in each other's arms, just relaxing, just savoring, taking in each other's sense, taking in each other's touch with your guard down, feeling safe and close. So being intentional about these touch points, the pre-sleep ritual, the post-sex ritual, those little touch points will also protect intimacy if you're going to try sleeping apart. Number seven, Remember that all major relationship changes take time to ease into, and that it's normal for one partner to feel more ready and more comfortable than the other. And so the same thing goes for a change in your sleep arrangement. So try to approach this strategic sleep arrangement as if the two of you are scientists and you're conducting an experiment. You have a hypothesis that this new setup might work a bit better for you. And so you're going to try it out and you're going to make observations about how it's going. 
And then you're going to come to a conclusion together. That attitude of trial and error and tweaking can help you feel patient with each other as you try this and just sort of have a spirit of collaboration. And then finally, suggestion number eight is for the parents. So if you have kids, and especially if you have kids who are old enough to be visiting other friends' homes, they're going to see on a range of sleep arrangements. And if you and your family are the only family where the big people are sleeping apart, you might feel worried that your kids are going to feel embarrassed that their family is different somehow. So I want to encourage you, rather than being worried or rather than you know thinking this means something's wrong with your family, I want to encourage you to use this as an opportunity to open up a conversation with your kids about all of the many, many ways that families are different. You can even make it into a game. I love (laughs) making things into a game. You can play a game together and try to figure out how many different kinds of families you know, all the different variables that the families you know are different on. Families with lots of pets, families with no pets, families with a grandparent who lives in the home, Families where there's only one grown up in the home. Families with a parent who travels a lot. Families with both parents who have the very same job. Families that have parents that sleep in their own bedrooms, right? So then in this way, your strategic sleep arrangement is just one of many, many, many ways that people can be a family. It's a chance to talk about all the ways of being a family. Not better, not worse, just creative and practical and loving. Okay, so final reminder that if you're already a newsletter subscriber, you will receive the worksheet with the relational self-awareness questions and all of these tips in your inbox. And if you're not a subscriber, you can sign up at dralexandrasolomon.com slash subscribe. And that link is also in the show notes. And then you will receive the companion worksheet next week. So I'm going to close this episode with a quote from Dr. Troxell, and it comes from a piece in Ted's How to Be a Better Human series. Dr. Troxell writes, all couples need to make sleep a priority in their relationships. Why? Because healthy sleep has the power to strengthen our relationships, while sleepless nights can lead to relationship harm. And I hope that no matter your sleeping arrangement with your current partner or with your future partner, that you regard this issue as one that is worth talking about and being creative about. Until next time, be well and sweet dreams. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love.